from uh, 18th Street here in San Pedro. Uh, this is the first last Thursday armchair art walk tour, and we're all glad to see you um, out there somewhere. It's kind of, I, I see why performers are so disconcerted about Facebook pages <laughs> and Zoom videos because you don't have any immediate reaction from anybody that's in the room except for Larson, who's right next to me. <laughs> so tonight we have three lovely guests Denise Boer, who is currently the president of the National Watercolor Society. Caroline Brady, who's the executive director of the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium. And last but not least is Juliana Ostrowski, um, who's here in, uh, doing her teaching residency. But I also wanted to say um, hey to our, um, our co-host, Bill Bush. And so, Bill, I, I asked you this earlier. What brought you joy this week? <laughs> well, and, and of course, I went, oh, you're kidding, right? <laughs> but... I, I actually, um, this is kind of an odd thing that brought me a, really a lot of joy, and I actually find myself choking up with joy about this, is uh, that young lady who is in many of our minds, Simone Biles. And uh, I'll tell you, I, I am, um, first of all, I have such great faith in our youth, um, given women uh, and, uh, like her. Um, her bravery, her candor, her uh, ability to be present with how she was being and, and what was so for her, um, I think is just magnificent. I think she is um, someone we should all be looking up to. And, and I, I think uh, that the th we don't always talk about this is that the mental health of, of all of us that produce things that make art, that do gymnastic, is as important as the physical conditioning. Yeah, you know, it's funny you say that. And I would even, um, I, I'm one of those that leans a little further to the right on that and say that, you know, perhaps mental health is even more important because people always overcome physical disabilities. Simone Biles is a perfect example. She has competed numerous times with broken toes and other ailments that would hold any other normal person, if you will back from competing at the level that she competes at. But it was very clear that it was the mental health was the thing that most concerned her. Um, and it was something that, uh, as we're seeing now in the Twitter sphere and Facebook, how many other um, athletes in her field, at least, have come out and said, you know what, I've had the same thing. I've and. Um, and, and by the way, I want to look back and I just can't remember her name, but the young tennis player who chose not to play at Wimbledon um, because there was a demand on her to be interviewed by the news. And she said, no, I can't do that. I'm going to bow out of doing interviews for my own mental health. And she was straightforward with it. And uh, they pressed her to, to uh, you know, you must. That's part of your contract with us. And she said, fine, I won't compete because her mental health was much more important to her. So hats off and a lesson for us all to learn. And, and maybe now we can really, you know, open the door wide for all of us to say, you know what, we all, we all need a mental health day once in a while, you know, at least a day. Completely agree, completely agree. So our first guest tonight that you're gonna be interviewing is Denise Boer. And uh, Denise is the current president of the National Watercolor Society. And during the pandemic last year, they celebrated their 100th anniversary. So I'm gonna turn over the talking to you and Denise. Well, that's great. Thank you very much, Denise. Hi, welcome. Hi, Bill. Thanks for uh, having me. Oh, well, I am very excited. I feel very honored to be uh, speaking with you. Maybe you could start by just telling us a little bit about uh, the National Watercolor Society and your role as president. Okay. Um, well, there's a lot of history there. Um, oh, did we just lose you? Okay. That's it. We've got you now, I think. You've got me now? Yes. So they've been around since, we've been around since the 1920s. Um, and we've gone through 100 years of artists from the beginning was we're mostly in California and then spread out through the United States and now there's our exhibit with us are so um, we've grown extensively in about um, 
I think it was 2009, we opened the NWS gallery in San Pedro, 915 South Pacific Avenue. And uh, so we've been having all our exhibits there since, since that time. Um, and we're really glad to be in San Pedro and it's a great art community. So, um, James exhibitions now that we have with other countries. Yes, I'm sorry, we missed a little bit about what you said, but no, no bother. Um, you, you talked about your, your membership growing during the pandem pandemic. It did. Um, surprisingly, it really flourished and grew through the pandemic. Um, how to teach virtually, um, just different programs that we did. And um, that brought in a lot more members from, and we'd have people. I think even when the gallery is, is for all our exhibits, I think we'll probably still have, maybe try and record, uh, do what they're doing right now, have part of it live. And have well, um, let, let me ask you, and hopefully you didn't say this already, because we're missing, at least I am missing a little bit of what you're saying, you're clipping in and out. And, and uh, so I apologize to the audience for that. Um, what was it about the pandemic that brought people? Do you think it was a cathartic kind of thing? Something, you know, was it just simply they had spare time or, or you know, what, why that interest in what I think is a, a very difficult art form? I think, um, I think people felt like they were trapped inside a bit. And so they really were looking to communicate with other people. Yeah. And I think that made a difference. I also think we, we at the National Watercolor Society Board made a big effort to do more outreach with the members and artists. Very, very, very Some good. Part of it. And, and do you see that, uh, are you continuing to grow, you know, now that we're supposedly coming out of this pandemic, who knows? Um, I do, yes. We've had really good response to our calls for entry and any meetings that we have that are virtual, yes. Wonderful. Um, now you've got some events coming up, uh, you know, coming up in uh, October and a few other things. Maybe, maybe you can tell us about some of the things that are coming up. In um, August, the South Bay Watercolor Society will be in the National Watercolor Society Gallery. I'll have an opening um, for first Thursday on September. And then October 1st, um, we're going to have the um, NWS volunteer will be in the gallery. And we'll be there for an opening um, the first Thursday, October 7th. The National Watercolor Society's 101st International Open Exhibition. Um, we'll open also October 1st, and that's virtually. And we're going to have a, a live virtual meeting on October 16th that everybody is welcome to come to. And the jurors, Ken Goldman, our esteemed jurors, are going to talk about all the paintings that were accepted into the exhibition and why they were. Kavanaugh. So it'll be a really interesting. We did this for our members exhibition and um, everybody really enjoyed hearing what the jury had to say. Great. And, uh, I'm hoping, I'm hoping Linda, we can get a, uh, maybe a link up at uh, somewhere in the, the feed that uh, will allow us to. We did, it's in the chat. So all Great. The websites that people are talking about or is uh, grace is putting them in the chat okay and linda i'm and i'm not hearing you as well as i'd like to be open on the, the august 5th first thursday but they will reopen again in time for the august i mean the september 2nd first thursday yes, yes. 
we're going to have a workshop. Mary White is going to be in the gallery um, in October for a workshop. Um, if I'm sure a lot of people know who she is. It's totally filled. And uh, we're working on a workshop with Ali Kavanaugh that will be publishing soon. That's going to be in November. So people can watch on our website at nationalwaterflowsociety.org for more information and with Linda when you public, you'll publicize it for us through your news splashes. Yes, and so you and are gonna, you have some images that you're gonna talk about, right? Yes. Yeah, well, let's see some of your work. All right. There we go. So, so this is, Go ahead. Well, go I, I was going to ask you a question. So as you as we're looking at your work and um, you've you uh, started with watercolors at a very early age, you you took to it. What what was it? A, and, and as I said just a little bit earlier, I I think of it as such a difficult medium to work in. Um, but uh, you've been doing it for quite a long time. What what drew you to it? And, and uh, maybe you can tell us as we're looking at some of your work, uh, uh, you know, about that. Well, I took a class through an um, um, art museum, mm -hmm. and uh, it, uh, I, I was, gosh, I don't know, maybe fourth grade, and yeah. they are. Oh, see, that's um, so beautiful. They, um, they have in the class, and the teacher had the director come and talk to me because I really and uh, it's kind of clicked with me. Yeah. And I've enjoyed it for a long time because it's a medium that's difficult and it does its own thing. You mix the water and the paint together and they interact and you're never sure exactly what you're going to get, which is really fascinating. <laughs> so the well, well, this piece in particular, you know, so, so it's a various levels of opacity and translucence and, and you must in your mind, was this far off from what you originally envisioned when you started it? It usually is. Really? Get, yes. I, I do some five by seven small paintings before I do the big one. I might do five or 10 of them to test it out and um it's never exactly what i think it's going to be when it's done it, you kind of just walk through it and it's like a little journey a, a journey yes it it sounds uh it sounds like at times a kind of a scary little journey um sometimes you're in the middle of it and you're not sure where it's going to come out so that's very mm -hmm. true yes, yes. So this is the end of my work. If you want to take a look at, uh, unless you had another question. The, well, no, I was just going to say that. So uh, obviously you're very inspired by nature. Yes, I am. And uh, it's beautiful, uh, your, your work. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm just, uh, when I look at you, when I look at pieces like this and, and uh, again, see the varying colors, the, um, I, I just I, I'm so uh, ad, admiring of what it takes to um, do this kind of work. It's beautiful. Thanks, Bill. This is a piece from the upcoming 101st International Open Exhibition by Elkin Memler. So I'm going to show you a few pieces in the upcoming show. She's from Germany. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this is a fantastic piece. Uh, by Nicholas Lopez and he's from Peru. And it's um, the granulating paint that you see here. Yes. Um, if you look what you can see, it takes you back to a little arched uh, doorway and it's yes. simply done, but it's not easy to get that, um, just the paint there and let it sit down and not overwork it. And it's just very fresh. This is by Jay Jing Jing from um, North Carolina. And it's just a real fresh painting. Um, put the paint down, let it sit, let it do its thing. And that's one of the wonders of watercolor. 
And this is an abstract piece um, yes. by Elaine Daly Bernbaum. It's a water media piece. Um, she does fabulous um, works. There's marks in there and paint. Um, I admire people that can do abstract work. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a unique piece by Judy Nuno called Repaired. Yes. Play on words there. <laughs> That's one of the things the National Water Quality Society does is to encourage innovation in water media. And this is a piece by Ken Call in what's a watercolor piece from Illinois. And uh, very, um, there's a lot going on in this, a lot of layers. And that's one thing that's really nice about most of our exhibitions, especially at International, it's very eclectic because we have three jurors that individually choose their pieces in the show. And when you put all their scores together, you get a very, a very of really excellent work. So it's yes. really fascinating. And our judge of awards right now is going through all the paintings for this exhibition, picking the awards. And, and how many um, paintings, uh, how, how many were submitted? There was around, there was almost 900 paintings submitted. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. So the, the um, competition is fierce. I bet. So, and that is all I have of the artwork. Do you want me to? And this stop will be here? all. This will be all part of, uh, or the the those that are chosen that are selected will be part of the uh, virtual international open. Yes, yes, and then and the jurors and the jurors will be there and will talk you through what they saw in each of these pieces, which is oh. really fascinating. And can you again give us the date of that? That is October sixteenth. Want information, you can go to our website, nationalwatercolorsociety.org, and it'll let you know the link to get on to see the virtual opening. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you. I, I don't know, Linda, if you have anything else. No, I'm just astonished at the quality of the work and that it's in our neighborhood. It, it's yeah. a, I, I'm uh, amazed. I, I thought they were you'd been here longer than 2009, but I really appreciate number one, your being there, and number two, opening the doors to the public because this work is not to be missed. Mm -hmm. No, we we actually bought the building in 1999, but they did a bunch of renovations, and so they started having the exhibition. Nice. So. You can stop screen sharing now if you would. Yes, I will. Well, it's good to see you. I hope to meet you in person one of these days. <laughs> I'll be out here in October. Awesome. Let me know. We'll have lunch. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just hang on with us and then um, so we'll get to the end and then we'll thank everybody. So okay. I want to. Um, just say a few words about uh, some of you might have heard that we are very busy bringing back the first Thursday art walk and we're going to be doing that in a soft opening kind of rehearsal on October 5th and at five o'clock that day in sirens most of you that know, are familiar with uh, San Pedro know where sirens is at the it's at the intersection of 7th and Mesa and uh, we will be doing a remembrance of Pat Carroll, who was um, a founding member of the Arts District and a board chair and just an all around amazing person. Um, she passed away last year on her 81st birthday. So we can't let that go without um, uh, recognizing all the wonderful th things that she did, not only for San Pedro, but for art, the arts in general. Um, uh, and then uh, at six o'clock, we are going to pick up tradition of uh, Pat Carroll's um, art walk tours and uh, lead a tour to uh, from Sirens to down the street to Menda Luna Schneider Gallery. Uh, and then at 645 or seven ish, there'll be a live performance of San Pedro song. One of our board members, husbands, Kathy, who's helping to lead the tours. Uh, wrote this poem to her and a bunch of musicians got together and scored it and recorded it and, and then they're going to perform it live on um, August 5th. So we're really excited about that. So I want to introduce um, Caroline Brady 
and Caroline Brady have n and I have known each other. We've lived here 25 years. I hate to say that we've, we're that old, but we've known each other at least that long. When I first moved here and Caroline was working in the council office for Janice Hahn, she helped me get um, trees planted in a six block area all around our house. And when it's hot here, I really appreciate that help because it does cool things off. Caroline is the executive director of the Cabrilla Marine Aquarium. Are you there? I'm here. There you are, looking gorgeous as always. Oh, thank um, you. And she's sitting in her office at the aquarium, right? Yes. And the, I chose the, the um, theme here of arts activists because I think that you exemplify that. You work in an aquarium and who would think that art is important, but you were really instrumental in um, uh, bringing back the, the gift shop to a, another level. And there's a piece of artwork in the window at the aquarium and it's a neon piece of art by Candace Gone. Um, but I'm going to uh, turn this over to you to talk about the aquarium and your commitment to the arts. Okay, I am going to share my PowerPoint that I put together. Thank you. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Then I did something right. Um, so I need to move that over here. So I'm not staring the other It's a direction. beautiful image. Yeah, you know, I, I love this place. I think it's so beautiful and I I hope that others can see the beauty in it. Maybe if we talk a little bit about more about it, um, that will happen. Um, this is a, a shot that Susan McKenna took. Most of the photos in here are from, from Susan. She's our gift shop manager and many of you probably know her, the um, founder of the corner store. So she sees art in everything and helps to uh, illuminate, illuminate that for all of us. Um, and I want to say we're really proud to be part of the California Cultural District. And I think the reason that we are, again, it's kind of counterintuitive, like why is an aquarium part of this? Well, um, it is because we are dedicated to letting people know about our Frank Gehry building, uh, the murals that we have um, from John Van Hammersfeld and other artists, including Candace Gowan. We've got the um, the beautiful uh, neon art that she made. And um, and inside the aquarium, if you really look and you pay attention, there's so many handmade items and um, beautiful pieces of art, whether it's a, a scientific drawing or a um, glass, a hand-blown um, glass jellyfish. They're, they're everywhere. And I've been here for almost eight years and I still keep discovering new things, so. I think that the reason I wanted the aquarium to be part of the cultural district is because you represent the jewel and the crown, so to speak, of our cultural assets. A very active museum with an active membership and uh, active in the community, and we're really grateful for that. Thank you. I, I don't think that some people here locally are aware of it, but we are Frank Gehry designed aquarium. Um, he was busy making uh, this foldable corrugated cardboard furniture. And then he kind of busted out uh, by rehabbing his house in Santa Monica, much to the chagrin of uh, people in the neighborhood actually, because he used materials that were considered cheap or common. Um, the um, fencing, the fence material, the chain link fence and corrugated steel. Of course, now everybody knows what a masterpiece that was. Um, but that's what he was a master of, is taking very common materials and doing something un uncommon with them. And he took, a, he took a look around our area and saw the ship masts and the containers and um, some of the other soaring, the bridges and other things and said, I, I'm going to do that with the aquarium. It's really just a series of boxes if you break it down. But then when you add the chain link, uh, it really takes on a, a beautiful shape, and I think it's prettiest at night, which is kind of weird. So in case you don't know who Frank or Gary is, here's some other, you know, buildings he did, you know, besides the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is an example of what I'm talking about. This is the inside in the courtyard. So you have this, you know, beautiful roof, essentially, which is very helpful for us because it keeps... Um, birds and raccoons and other animals from getting in um, but it also gives you a great place to hang other things and to display um, things i think great architects know i'm the backdrop 
I'm, you know, it, the building is white and, and gray and it's very plain. Um, and then it allows other things, other pieces of art and other, and the human beings and the plants and everything else to shine. Um, here's an example of, of one of those birds. We've got a heron perched on top. I, I, this is constant. You leave here at night and there's animals, there's um, raccoons crawling all over the place. And Caroline, uh, sorry, sorry, forgive me for interrupting, but we're not seeing the next slide. You're not seeing this one? You didn't we see, see the, the art and architecture slide, but we're not seeing, is there one after this that you're talking to? Yeah. You don't see Frank Gehry right now? Uh, no. <laughs> what did I do wrong? No, no, I, no. I'm going to get some technical support because I spent a lot of time making this and I don't want you to hold on just a second. Take hold your up. time. <laughs> hey, Diane. As some of you know, the aquarium was started by um, John Olgin, who was sort of like the father of San Pedro. His wife, Muriel, was it was a, um, a painter and had a studio in uh, the Fourth Street Lofts. Not and and I'm fond of saying that people um, that don't have a Muriel Olgin are really not San Pedrans. You have to have a, a, a one of her, a piece of her work. Mm. Um, There's a here. It's, uh, it's paused. But John was one of these people that was fond of saying, just do it. Okay, th there it goes. Okay. Thank you. So I still am gonna use these little advancers down here, right? This little arrow thing. Okay, so here's Frank. I noticed nobody laughed when I said, here's some of his other buildings, you know, just some, <laughs> some other ones besides the aquarium. Um, and this is what I was saying about how, you know, using the architecture as a backdrop, you know, you've um, got this beautiful chain link uh, ceiling or roof, but all of these, we can use all of the structures to hang beautiful pieces of art um, to show what we do and showcase, you know, what we think is important in any given time. And then I uh, was talking about how the birds and the animals love our building too, and they're constantly roosting on it. And um, when you leave at night, sometimes there's entire families of raccoons up there, which is kind of scary, but kind of cool too. Um, and then the next phase of the of the building built in 2004 uh, was done by Barton Phelps, who is a protege of Frank Gehry's. And um, he's he's probably the most famous for the pickup sticks part of the building, which people call it or chopsticks. Um, I love it. It represents a crashing wave. Here's a really nice photo of that. If you look, um, you can see how the on the far left there, the um, sticks are kind of straight up in the air and then they start to crash down. It's kind of a modern deconstructed version of the, the famous waves, um, the Japanese wave. Um, here's at night. I just think it's really cool the way it looks at night. And you can see the big shadows of cars going by. Another photo of it during the day. I just think it's absolutely beautiful. This is uh, the, the part where my office is right behind um, this sculpture and the library is off to the side. It's a beautiful library, and I never heard that story about the uh, the crashing waves. I noticed them, but I didn't know that's what they meant. So thank you. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and and then of course several years ago we um, I got to meet John Van Hammersfeld when he came to San Pedro, came back into our our lives in our area. Of course, he's the the famous artist, the artist most famous for his endless summer poster and um, he started coming to the aquarium and I said, well, we'd really love to have a mural. And he said, absolutely, I can't wait to start. Um, and, and, and donated his time and his energy to um, make the murals here. And really kind of went out of his comfort zone. He hadn't really done um, animals before. And I think he really had a ball with it. This is um, one of the murals on the front of um, on, on the back side of our marquee. And this is where everybody goes to pose. And I think it's funny when people pose with the mural, they stand right on top of it or touch it. And I always walk over and say, come forward about five feet and then you'll get the whole mural in. And I, I never understood that why people think they have to step right on top of it. Um, here's the side view of it with a rainbow, which I think is pretty cool. Um, it just makes a beautiful backdrop for, for parties and for events and just, uh, nobody can resist it. This is on the front of the gift shop and um, the, the um, buildings 
are supposed to represent a ship and also the cliff of, of Palos Verdes. So it kind of does double duty here. And the, you see the cool clouds and the, he had never done a brown pelican and spent a lot of time working on that. He was really thrilled and excited about um, that representation. Um, here's a picture of it, uh, how it looks on the actual building. Um, this is a, the uh, a, a little cross section of it with the sunset behind. I just think it's, it's, What's so great about these murals is depending on the time of the day and how the sun is shining and who's there and what's happening with nature, they just they change and they they just continually delight me when I go walk home uh, to my car to go home from work. I just kind of stop and look at them every day. Um, here's the picture with me and, and John, and this is what people do. They like to pose in front of them. Um, and various elements, again, he had never done these fish or, or an octopus. And um, we ended up using a lot of these images in our gala invitations and on postcards and, and mugs and all kinds of things. And, and John was never about how much money can I make from this or what can I do? He just loves the aquarium and he, he, uh, he gave us all the rights to everything that we did. Um, also, let me tell you a little bit about the technical part of the mural. It's actually... He, he um, did the art, it was digitized, and then it is basically wallpapered onto these 3M panels. So, and they guarantee that they will stay this bright and this great for 10 years. And if something happens to part of the panel, we can have it reprinted and put back up. So it's kind of neat. It's not actually painted on there, it's, it's wallpapered. Hmm. Um, here's some pictures of some kids, like I said, like right on top of it. Um, but it's just irresistible. It's hard to walk by it and not get your picture taken in front of it. And we, we think the murals are such a big part of what we do. They add ambiance, they add energy, um, they make the food even look better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just, we love to hang out near them. We love to be around them. This, our, this area was never really somewhere people lingered and now they do. We bought this furniture that you can see in the background. It's made out of recycled milk jugs um, and people are there all the time. When I said, let's build a deck and put it out behind the gift shop, I was told no one will ever sit there. And it's not true. We a, we well, I also little... think it goes to your uh, desire to have this be a, a, a recurring destination for people to come and hang out, uh, go to the gift shop, have their picture taken, see the exhibits. And um, the events that you do there really do make it a destination. And, and art makes people feel welcome and art makes people feel creative. Just being around the art makes you feel like somehow I'm, I'm attached to this, I'm involved in this, and this, this is part of who I am because I enjoy it. Um, I, I think it's, it's changed everything for us. These are some of the, like I was telling you, the coffee cups that we have. Um, and some of the products. This is just where two murals come together. I think it's really neat looking. Um, and this is, I just think this is so beautiful. This is the backdrop where all the fish and the octopus are before it was, um, this is just part of the layering. And again, we use this, we made panels and put it up at our gala and, and um, had it as postcards and other things. I just think it's so gorgeous. Something as simple as, you know, kelp can be really beautiful if you interpret it. The right way. Kelp is really some, beautiful. Yeah, some little snapshots from the octopus. And then even um, a lot of what we have art as art here is um, scientific art. So each one of these drawings was made by an artist uh, really studying the fish. Um, and it was put together for a guide to, um, Mil it's called Miller and Lee's Guide to California Marine Fishes. It was first made in the 70s and hadn't been updated since then. And our team uh, took it upon themselves to spend, they spent eight years testing all the keys for these different fish and they and identified a bunch of species. And I said, hey, we did all this work to do this art. Let's do something with it um, besides the book. So that became the backdrop. I don't know if, if you've all been here lately, but we had the entire aquarium is surrounded by a fence which I thought was kind of ugly um, because it had barbed wire and it looked kind of unwelcoming. And you could see all the back of the house stuff that was kind of, you know, not always so neat and tidy. So now all the fence is covered in scientific um, drawings. And if you look really closely here, there's, I don't th think you can see it in this section, there's even a, a female diver that's really 
I, I really love that part. So inside the aquarium in the courtyard too, there's panels. So now they can say to a, a child, this is a whale shark, the actual size, and you stand next to it and you kind of go, wow, I had no idea they were that big. It's, it's, it's art that's got a purpose, but it's also beautiful. We, we love that. Here's another part of it. You can see where we kind of cover the, some of the machinery and so forth. And, and that's the library up above, right? Or the entrance yeah. to, okay. That is the library. It's got the best view in, of Cabrillo Beach in San Pedro. Um, and then this is Candace Gone, and we had a piece that she made for us years and years ago, and it got wet and damaged. And I, and when I said, I've always wanted to see what this thing looks like on, let's get it fixed. And Candace came and with a technician and they replaced some, some burnout fuses and some other things. And, and then we got this beautiful art piece back. I couldn't find a nighttime picture. I know I have one, but if you can see it's, this is looking out the window through the art piece. It's, it's stunning and it's on every night until it comes on it at dusk and it stays on till 10 o'clock. So if you drive by, you can see it. Awesome. It's really beautiful. Um, and last but not least, this is Evie Templeton. She's a longtime illustrator for Cabrillo Marine Aquarium and her work is everywhere throughout the aquarium. Um, we had a piece of hers that was probably in the most popular exhibit the um, Tidepool Touch Tank and kind of short-sighted, but they painted it on plywood and it's been hanging there since 1981. And over the years, pieces of it got chipped and, and faded and it was kind of rotting and falling apart, but we didn't want to just take it down and throw it away. So during the pandemic closure, what we did is we um, found a way to digitally um, take pictures of it and then recreate it and correct it. it. This is a really weird, long, skinny photo, but it, that's because it goes the entire length of the Typhoon Touch Tank. And the um, graphic artist that worked on this just painstakingly went through every single animal and fixed every single little <clears throat> blip and glitch. And now it, it stretches the entire length of the exhibit. You're surrounded by it. So when you walk in, you're face to face with a hermit crab who's bigger than you are and it's it's almost as if you're swimming along with these animals and then they we added the top panel um to cover the fence all together so now instead of looking at stuff in the back of the house which at some point they thought was kind of romantic and cool um now you're completely immersed in in this wonderland and, we're and I, I hadn't realized until we came back to the opening after being shut down from covid was that it it's you're supposed to it's meant to be like you're underwater with the rest of the animals in the tide pool and it's so vibrant and it makes so much more sense now than it used to that that you brought it back so it, it was really lovely experience to go see it and uh, in it's all of its glory yeah you, if you haven't seen it you have to come back and and check it out um this is just a close-up of one of the the crabby crab i think we call him and that's pretty much it well, thank you. Sorry you might want to reiterate when the, the people can come to the gala and when that is and how they get tickets. Sure. Um, our gala is coming up on September 25th. Please, everybody, if you haven't been vaccinated, go get vaccinated and tell everybody you know to do that. Um, we actually I wanted to tell you we had a vaccination clinic at the aquarium and also a big food giveaway um, during the closure. Um, so September 25th, you can get tickets. I put my um, email address and my website there. Um, it's a great way to see the aquarium in its full glory because we have lighting people come in and they light up the, uh, the roof line and do all kinds of neat things for the, for the event. And it's, it's really pretty and it's nice to spend time there. Um, the, and you can see everything, the, all the art that's here anytime you want. The aquarium is free and open to the public. We do ask people to make a donation, but no one ever pressures you or, or you know, makes you feel weird about it. It's uh, a part of our mission to make that uh, available to anyone, regardless of their ability to pay. Um, so come on down and look at it. You'd be, we, you'd be surprised how many folks come from all over the world to see Frank Gehry's building 
and um, and now John Van Hammersfeld's art as well. And we're really proud of it and hope to continue adding more art and having art events. Um, if any of you are interested in, um, if you wanna do some kind of watercolor show or art show here, that's um, things that are related to the to the marine environment, we would love to have you. We do have a photo contest every year and we work with Linda also to show um, films and have speakers that are about um, the environment or the oceans. We're really open to that and we, and we wanna promote what you do and appreciate what you do. We're, um, as I mentioned, we're on the 40th anniversary of the opening of this building. And so we're planning an event um, in October to honor Frank Gehry and his contribution to, to our place here. Um, so we'll make sure that you all get invited to that as well. Well, thank you. And thank you for, for being such a, a serious and uh, diligent cultural partner. Um, and uh, that's the locus of what we're going to try and do next year in the Arts Appreciation Series is talk about the culture and how it influences us. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. So I'm going to turn this over to Bill Bush, and he's going to interview Juliana. Thank you, Caroline. You can stop screen sharing. There you go. You're still screen sharing, Caroline. OK. There you go. Hi, Juliana. How are you? I'm good. Hi, Phil. I um, switched my background because I'm in like kind of a, a work office. Yeah, well, tell us about that work office. You're a yeah, uh, artist so, in residence? Yeah, so I'm an artist in residence for a place called Cardboard City. It's on Third Street Promenade. Ah. Yeah, and it's a space that was given, granted um, to Rediscover Center. Um, I've been affiliated with Rediscover Center as a <clears throat> as a teaching artist facilitator. Well, can you, tech, can you tell us a little bit about what the Rediscover Center is for those that don't yeah. know? Yeah, so Rediscover Center is a creative reuse space yeah. um, and tinkering space. So we um, promote, um, you know, maker education. Uh, we teach children to use very dangerous tools. Um, <laughs> we teach them how to use, um, yeah. And so I'm trying to see if we could, I, I only see your face bill. So I was like going to see if I could add to spotlight so we can have a conversation, but, yeah. um, well, so yeah. anyway, so yeah, so, and it's, um, it's a, it's a really cool, it's very, um, you know, it's on the main space is on Washington, like mm -hmm. below Centinella. So it's very centrally located and, um, you well, know, correct. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole concept behind rediscover is uh, don't they repurpose materials that would normally yeah, be yeah. discarded and thrown out? So not exactly. only are they learning, uh, are they discovering art, but they're utilizing materials that normally we would call trash, right? Am I right? In yeah, saying? so yeah, so we, um, yeah, we don't call it trash because- no, of course not. Uh, but um, so, so the cardboard city was, um, has um, so it's it's in a temporary space that was given to us by Santa Monica, mm -hmm. city of Santa Monica, and um, it's open from twelve to six to public. Um, you can come in and create, you know, um, anything you want. You can come in by yourself, with, you know, adult, family, children, whatever. And they also have a small part of it that is artists in residence. They also have a gallery um, featuring artists who use cardboard ah. for their main material. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really fun. And it's on Third Street. Like, you know, how can you go wrong? It's like you can grab your latte and stroll in, do some art. Um, and so um, and I'm here as an artist in residence for four days. I'm creating a cardboard tapestry and um, I'm also making prints and you can actually come in and join me, you know, make, make prints yeah. and, make and help with you. Me. Yeah, very neat. That's Very the whole point. It's a great concept, and I'm really glad that grad, glad, glad, grad, I'm glad that we got this. So, um, and then yeah. So, and then also tomorrow, I'm leading a workshop um, for LACMA. It's on. It's a virtual workshop 
Yeah. It's for 21 and up because we're going to have drinks. And, um, and so I don't have to watch my language. Well, maybe <laughs> I will. Um, and so we're making um, basically kind of like, um, it's, a, it's called a tapestry. It, it's a um, uh, postcard tapestry. So we're going to think about this whole idea of male art and uh, using um, things that you'll never wear after pandemic, but cutting them up and making tapestries out of them. So um, like men's ties. Yes. For example. Yes. You're probably never going to be back in style. No, <laughs> no, no, no. No, that re reminds me of a bar I went to once where if you wore a tie into it, they would cut the tie and then hang the rest of it up over the bar. Um, and I think that's a good idea. I think we should get rid of some of those formalities, loosen up a little bit, especially after the uh, the pandemic. But um, you're a, uh, you study painting and sculpture. Yeah. And um, did you, you're quite the educator. I mean, you're very involved in teaching and um, uh, sharing, you know, your skills and your knowledge, d uh, d which, you know, I, I always wonder, uh, are you, you know, what brings you to that? What not, not all artists are unselfish like that and are willing to go out there and kind of share their work and, and, and do that, especially with children. And you work a lot with younger, uh, younger, uh, folks. Um, yeah, my, my, the age range of people, um, really, varies you know i do work with kids but i also work with adults and uh, okay. uh, yeah so um you know i i kind of after um a certain point i realized that i'm really a community artist mm -hmm. um which to me means that i engage uh with people to kind of encourage them to use their creative you know creative force um mm -hmm. that's within them so and also to kind of um, you know bring people together, um, yeah. and and teaching seemed to also be part of that. But I also do um, public engagement um, work at LACMA. I uh -huh. you know create projects, and so I also um, you know like do these kind of residencies and um, murals. I really enjoyed looking at the murals. Yeah. Um, at the yeah. aquarium because I also make murals <laughs> mostly for schools but um, probably have done other ones I can't remember now but I would love if there's a little corner of the aquarium um, I would love to do a tiny little corner somewhere maybe like That's a track wonderful. camp. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that you so you're all about bringing art to the people and not just to show them but to get them involved in it as well but you're an artist yourself and I think you've brought some of your work to show us yeah, so it's interesting because I, uh, at first I put together the presentation that involves my, um, you know, my uh, sort of public engagement stuff, but yeah. then I decided like my very quiet studio practice that actually keeps me sane yeah. and um, is much more like maybe I'll show that and then, you know, so um, I'll, I'll share that. So if you don't see any of my teaching in there is because I, I'm you know, I'm showing you a part of me that's very private and uh, and then there we go. So let me, so should I share screen now? Yes. Oh, let's, let's see some of the work right away. Yes. Okay. There we go. It, it has a, it has a dramatic beginning. Ah, the end. <laughs> um, all right. So I don't know. So this, it starts at the end because, um, there was sort of like at the end uh, when the pandemic began. So, so this is what I was doing before pandemic. I was actually designing. Um, and by the way, the watercolor stuff was so amazing because I work a lot in um, watercolor. Well, not necessarily watercolor, but a lot of water medium. Like I used um, uh, water. I use gouache and, and inks and all kinds of stuff. But mm -hmm. I was working on a project that design it, it, to design um, vessels um, that collect groundwater and store food. Um, and I was just about to create prototypes when all of that just came to a halt. Sure. Um, so then again, watercolor. These are kind of, you know, just big, whatever standard big watercolor paper. I don't know, maybe. 18 by 24 or 24 by 36, maybe 24 uh -huh. by 36. And um, this was um, 
me thinking about in March about this whole idea of separation, like how are we going to unglue and get unstuck? And I thought about these sort of um, ways that we're all attached together. And, um, you know, all of these kind of, um, it's just, uh, you know, impossible to separate. Mm -hmm. um, then after the lockdown, <laughs> I wanted to uh, make sure that um, we all stay calm. And so not only did I start carving um, print, printmaking and doing mm -hmm. carving plates, but I also did a bunch of workshops um, and that, you know, where we did linoleum cuts and wood cuts um, and uh, carving plates was incredibly, incredibly calming. But the image of course is, has to do with like mental health and, um, you know, just kind of the idea of families and water pouring out of the buildings, you know, sort of dramatic. Yeah. But the, the experience was good. The so experience the experience, and by the experience, you mean the actual process of cut of the cutting and the that that painstaking process, but very slow and methodical process, just very calming. Is that what you're speaking of? Yeah, I mean the image of of course is opposite of calm. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it it's um, it was there was a lot of drama in the image itself, but the actual process was very calming. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So and then um. I work, um, so, you know, we, everybody got locked inside with their families and my partner, Carl Petion is also an artist. And mm -hmm. we got this typical sort of thing where one, we, we like where one starts and the other begins kind of started to fade. And so it was just funny because we kept arguing about who had the idea first. <laughs> and so um, that's why I called this, <laughs> that it was, um, you know, that that this was his idea, but. Yeah. Um, and then of course, um, my dad is with, me as, with us as well. So I kept thinking about this whole idea of like protecting him and the breath is like having, so I was just kept thinking about the breath being, you know, it's like the pandemic breath. But um, he did finally get vaccinated, so that that was. Um, but yeah, my father's breath. I you know it was the breath was something that I was thinking about the whole entire time. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is another fun thing that I did that has nothing to do with um, kind of my own practice, but was super fun. Um, Otis has a community live drawing class that went on Zoom, and they, they were like forty or more people there at a time. And we all drew live models. And I just picked these two because I thought it was hilarious because this model was like, really had the the way that she's like over it. Um, yeah. And then um, the other one is was actually a model that worked for herself. And she works for herself on Zoom. And there are a lot of models that did that started doing that. And um, I thought that was really interesting. And also just taking another look at that weird, weird world of live drawing mm. and people who are involved in it. Um, and then um, this was, um, uh, you know, I, st I started getting fed up with flat work and re like took drawings and prints and made them into these seeds, um, spheres. And then this was um, a portrait of my son who also lives with me because of the pandemic and whatever, all the situations. But I just thought, you know, to make this portrait look like a boulder. Um, and then this is um, kind of a current direction. I'm making lots of um, collages yes. and, uh, and uh, yeah. And then this is kind of, I wanted to, I put this because I kind of want to work on digital art. Mm -hmm. So I put this together, a placeholder for the future. Uh, and then this is my workshop for tomorrow, but I think the registration is closed, but it should be good anyway. Uh, well, it's wonderful work. You you really, um, and, and I don't wanna say this in the wrong, you're, all, don't take this the wrong way. You're all over the place. You like to do a lot of different things. You're really uh, got your hands in a lot of different media. 
um, and uh, different ways of expressing yourself and expressing your work. Where does that where does that come from? Where that that uh, um, well, I, of the medium? Well, primarily was because I really, you know, when I was in New York, I really kind of I, I used to curate shows and, you know, was very much part of that very exciting world, New York world in the like 80s and 90s. And then after that, when I came, when I left, I was like, oh God, this is like putting work on white walls was really boring to me. And mm -hmm. um, I was never interested. I, I just, you know, it's like, uh, yeah. So the work that I do is similar to the work I do with public, which is um, I do whatever I want at that moment. You know, I don't mm -hmm. really, I'm not interested in like making, um, the same body of work, like it is boring to me. So I, I do whatever I want at whatever time. Mm -hmm. Since I don't have to, you know, mm -hmm. I don't live off my works and it, I have a privilege of doing whatever I want. <laughs> yes. Well, does that answer it? <laughs> that spontaneity is wonderful because I think that's what uh, helps in your work when you bring your work out into the community is that ability to be spontaneous, to have others be spontaneous. Because I think what holds a lot of people back from art is the feeling of, oh, I can't do that, you know, and, and they kind of box in their definition of art and you go exactly the opposite. You're expanding the box that art is in, in fact, probably exploding the box. I would like to explode the box and I would like to um, have everybody else participate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hopefully it's just going to be one big explosion of creative energy. And if I can facilitate that a little bit in the world. I'm well, there. I think we're, we're all behind you in, in being that facilitator. Thank you so much. My Thank pleasure. you so much, Juliana. It's so great to meet you. Someday I'll meet you in person. And I want to give a mm -hmm. shout out to Terry Nauman and Inej Bush for introducing us. And um, you are your work is so fascinating and evolving, yeah. and that's what makes it exciting. So I want to thank you. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to uh, say a few words uh, about Pat Carroll again. If you, if you can find it in your heart to um, donate some money to continue this kind of work, this and the uh, live guided tours, we would be very appreciative of that. And um, the next armchair will be on um, August 26th. And I want to thank all the people that were, <laughs> oh, Larson's having trouble keeping up with me. So I want to thank all the people that helped us. Uh, some of the folks that aren't here, like Cheryl Holtzman, helped us promote this. And we really appreciate that. And thanks to Scott, Maria, Fred, Sylvia, and Margaret for joining us. I hope you found something valuable to hear today. And thanks for being out there. Um, the background that I'm sitting in front of is one of two new uh, painted storm drains at the corner of 6th and Harbor um, that we got a pilot grant from the port. And so maybe you can go see them in life. Um, the one behind me was painted by Chadem Akbe, who helped us with the Sirens mural. So I want to thank everybody for being here. And again, the next one is at 530 on the 26th, and we'll be featuring um, uh, Ray and Cora, of who own Gallery Azul, and they'll be talking about how do you pronounce that? Bill Lotoria, the um, they Lotoria. Lotoria. They are um, like tarot cards, but they're Mexican tarot cards. So the whole exhibit is different uh, Lotoria cards. So I want to thank you all for being here, especially our guests Caroline, Denise, and Juliana, and thank you, Bill, for being so patient. And we'll oh, see you all next month. Thank you, Linda. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. Nice to meet everybody. Thank you. Hang on a bit. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thanks, everyone.